Good afternoon and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. We are live streaming from the Boathouse at Confluence Park. I'm Deb Hackathorn, member of the CMC Board of Trustees and also a government relations professional with the law firm Frost Brown Todd. Metro Club live streaming is presented by the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch, PNC, and NBC4I. Thank you. We'd also like to thank those of you who purchased a virtual seat today. We're grateful for your support. Largely because of you, we are able to continue our live streaming. You can learn more about CMC, register for our events, join or renew your membership, purchase a virtual seat, or make a donation anytime at columbusmetroclub.org. Now to today's forum, COVID and kids, red flags for future success. Our forum is sponsored by the Robert Weiler Company and NBC4. We can all cheer a return to school for children whose lives have been disrupted by the pandemic, but enrollment numbers in schools in all grades are lower than pre-pandemic rates. The numbers are sobering. Last month, the Ohio Department of Education reported a 3% drop in public school enrollment, or 53,000 children statewide. While some may have moved to homeschooling or have delayed enrollment, the sheer numbers alone suggest that there may be children simply missing from school. Combined with early warning signs like a looming eviction crisis, increased truancy, and greater needs for food assistance, those suggest that we do need to check on our children. For a look at what's happening at the ground level, please welcome our guests, Executive Director and Pastor Emeritus, United Methodist Church and Community Development for All People, the Reverend John Edgar, Children's Advocate and Clinical Therapist at Star House, Jill Gores, CEO at Impact Community Action, Robert Bo Chilton, and our host, co-anchor at NBC4, Matt Barnes. Matt, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Devin. It's good to be here and to discuss what is a very important issue, um, obviously not just in uh, Columbus, but uh, all across the country. Uh, happy to have three, I feel like, experts in this topic because you all are right on the front lines of, of what's going on out there uh, with our children and, and in Central Ohio. So let's jump right in. Uh, we'll just go kind of go down the line here just so everyone can kind of get an idea of your background and, and the current state of affairs um, with how you're approaching and what you're seeing with kids and COVID um, and, and how it's affecting them. Uh, each of you I know have a different, uh, more expertise in this and maybe the other. So we'll start with you, Robert Agger, just what are you seeing and, and kind of just how the current situation is, the issues you're facing. Sure, I would begin by just uh, stating what is perhaps the obvious, that all across central Ohio, certainly on the south side, where I lead the work of a nonprofit called Community Development for All People, uh, our children are facing unprecedented challenges caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. And so for us, it's about what can we do at the ground level uh, to make a difference. We do direct services, so we're providing food to families where uh, kids are living and their parents have lost work or have had their hours cut back. And so we operate the largest point of distribution of free food anywhere in central Ohio that served 45,000 low-income families this past year. And then directly for the kids themselves, as uh, I think we'll be talking a lot more about, there's this issue of what's happening because of the disruption in how the schools have been functioning. Schools were closed, schools were then open for remote learning. Now a lot of Columbus kids are in hybrid uh, settings in school a couple days and then home the rest of the week. So we're one of the nonprofits that operate what are called learning extension centers. Five days a week, Monday through Friday for the whole school day, our uh, facilities are open and we have kids in appropriate social distancing in small settings with adult educators, making certain every child has a laptop, every child has strong, consistent internet connection and a positive encouragement to stay connected, to stay focused and interact with other students. Those LECs also include providing breakfast and lunch. So it's one of the services that can help but we should make no mistake about it, this is still incredibly traumatic for our children and we as a community have this affirmative urgency, what more are we gonna do to help our kids stop falling behind and catch up and how do we support the families along the way? Jill? 
So I work at Star House, which is a drop-in center for youth experiencing homelessness between the ages of 14 and 24. And so um, I think we've been working at this at a few different levels. We have minors. Our num the number of minors that have been utilizing our services just skyrocketed in March. And then we also have youth who have their own children, usually toddler age or babies. And so we've been um, trying to find ways to make sure that the minors are getting back on track and in school and with a family or in a home where they're safe. And then also doing a lot of work with the, the young parents, the young moms typically, to make sure that they have everything they need to care for their child. And that's just, there's just, so most of our youth live these years teetering on the edge, right? And then when COVID hit, it just sort of like popped them right over the edge. And so um, it's been a lot of, with, with their food and their shelter being so uh, precarious, they, the focus on education, focus on even things like jobs and careers and all of the things that we like to focus on to help them move forward has been a luxury that we haven't been able to afford. And so it's just been a lot of basic needs. How do we help them make sure there's food in their house if they're housed, make sure that they're getting where they need to go so that they don't get completely um, you know, knocked off the map with this. So. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here. And um, I, I really uh, take pleasure in sharing the stage uh, with my two colleagues here. Um, <clears throat> in Africa, there is a tribe known as the Mighty Maasai. And one of the ways in which they would greet one another is to say, and how are the children? Um, among the many fabled and accomplished tribes of Africa, no tribe was considered to have warriors more fearsome or more intelligent than the Mighty Maasai. Uh, the traditional greeting among the Maasai is, and how are the children? This is an acknowledgement of the high value that the Maasai placed on children's well-being. Even warriors with no children would answer with the traditional greeting, all, all of the children are well. This meant, of course, that peace and safety prevailed, the priorities of protecting the young and the powerless are in place, that the Maasai people had not forgotten their reason for being, their proper function and their responsibilities. All the children are well means life is good. It means the daily struggles of existence, even among poor people, include the proper care of the young and defenseless. I wonder what it would look like if every adult among us parent and non-parent alike felt an equal weight here in Columbus to make sure that the children are well. What would it look like if every parent and non-parent carried the equal weight here in Ohio and across the nation? I wonder whether we could truly say without hesitation, the children are well. Yes, all children are well. Of course, we know some of the children are doing well and they're resilient, they've been innovative. We've seen TikTok videos and all types of entertaining, creative ways in which children show their res resiliency. And for that, we celebrate. Um, but we know that not all children are well. Some are the proverbial canary in the coal mine. It's a signal of what is yet to come and some of their focus is not necessarily on the red flags uh, to success, but there's our red flags for survival. And so I wanna unpack that more. I've talked to the, the kids. We also operate a learning extension center. I thought it was important to hear their voice and to share their words with this community. Well, thank you all for being here and, and kind of giving us an idea of the work each of your organizations do. I wonder what's, what's been the biggest challenge into reaching uh, the children of our community right now. We know that they're out there, but getting them to come find your services, getting them to, uh, to get the help they need, uh, it's not always easy to find them and, and to reach them, even though you know they're out there. You know, how are you doing it? And then, you know, I guess, what, how are you trying to make sure that they, they find a way forward, you know, to find some more success? And what is a very trying time? So I, I'll take a stab at that. Um, <clears throat> I'll say our best ambassadors for engaging kids and getting them into our learning extension centers have been the other kids. They are the greatest recruiters. Um, 
you know, we think it's important to talk to the kids and we provide a safe space in which they can interact. They can, we're, we're focused on academic support and social emotional learning. The thing that brings them in and engages them is one, we're prov providing food and transportation. And two, we're providing a safe space where they can have honest conversation and social interaction. When we asked them and I told them I would be coming to this panel, what are some of the things that they would want our community to know? And so in their own words, uh, some of the things they shared, they said, society expects us to shut up and adjust to everything that is going on without considering how we feel about things. It feels as though no one considers how much we've been impacted by COVID, whether from our parents, the schools, and the city as a whole. We feel like we are being penalized in school because we are struggling with virtual learning. Even those of us who have phones, we still feel isolated from our friends and the life that we used to live. And this one really hit home because I, I observed it up close and personal uh, being at eviction court. Uh, th this particular student said, the stress, of our the stress that our parents are going through trickles down to us and we can feel it every day. Not only feeling what they are passing down to us, but the stress that comes from seeing our parents like that. So having that safe space, having that interaction, providing for basic needs is critically important. And honestly, we, we have to do more to reach more kids. If we start to reach them, then they start to tell their friends. And when we talk about the safe space that we've created and they can come and talk and interact, and even me as the CEO, when I come into the room, I have to respect the, the space um, and, and not judge anyone. Uh, that becomes the greatest way to engage our students. I would follow up on what Bo's saying that I think it is an awful lot about the relationships that we're trying to build in general and how that becomes um, the springboard for the trust in this current situation of, of crisis. And so as Bo was saying, yeah, the, our best recruiting tool is simply one child talking to another about it's better when they're with um, in a group setting, there's the support, the encouragement. And then building out from that, it's also the relationships with the parents. And so uh, as Bo was saying, and, and the one quote from the child, our parents are, are in enormous stress, particularly in, in low income areas like such as the South Side. And that does trickle down to the kids. And, and also the kids make their decisions to some degree, but they're not independent actors. And so if that family is in crisis about fearing they're gonna be evicted or if the utilities have been turned off or there's not food on the table, it's very hard just to have the stability to encourage that child to get up and come over to a learning extension center. So it's a holistic approach. And, and rather than focusing on the negative part of it, it's the fact that we can build upon relationships that we've established in these various organizations and use it now when the time is especially uh, critical. And then to throw in just one other story along with uh, the ones that Bo was sharing, uh, we're finding that this, uh, having the learning extension centers are really helpful for the kids that actually would have maybe made it on their own, but are so much happier to be back in a social setting. And so, you know, I think of one uh, young uh, girl who is just way ahead in class, reads well beyond her grade level, and yet she was so frustrated and demoralized by being in a sense trapped at home in virtual learning. And so able to come to a learning extension center, make new friends, have adults that will be supportive, it just has brought her back to life and she is not alone. <laughs> At Star House, we, we had to close for a section of the day. Typically, we're 24-7, which is something we're proud of. But when COVID hit, we had staffing issues, and we had to make time for sanitation. And so now we're closed for a portion of the day. And we also saw pretty quickly that the young folks who had kids, they stopped coming to Star House. And then we also had um, requested that if you have, if you, a lot of our kids had recently been moved into an apartment of their own for the first time, and so we were asking them to stay home, which is different than our typical policy. And we quickly learned that we had to adapt. And so we started using that time when the building was closed to do outreach. We took our clinical team, which is clinical coaches or caseworkers and therapists, and we just started going out to where they were. Um, we have 
the home outreach, which is where we'll take therapy or parenting skills and always food to their homes. And that sort of was our only way for the longest to keep tabs on how they were doing and what they needed and where they were connected. And so it was a lot of laptops trying to get Title 20 applications, you know, with a hotspot. And um, then also just kind of hitting the ground, sending out our star car, we call it, to downtown and to libraries and soup kitchens, places where we know that homeless youth tend to congregate and um, just re really trying hard to find the ones, because there were a lot of kids that became homeless with COVID because of, for a variety of reasons, not having to go to school, their parents could kick them out of the house without really any me immediate consequences. Um, and so we've just been working really hard to go where they are and find them and bring resources to them or bring them to us, whichever one seems to work better. And so it's been a lot of, a lot more community work than what we typically have been doing. You guys mentioned the pressures of, that were already, the pressures and stresses that are already on families before COVID. I mean, the food, in, food insecurity was already there. Housing insecurity was already there. Um, you know, just the ability to pay for, you know, whether it's utilities or diapers or whatever it might be, this only added more stress to it. And then I think about being apart from your classmates, you know, your friends, uh, because that's what you know, we t were telling people is, you know, kind of keep your distance. How has this affected the mental health of the kids you're seeing um, that, you know, you might see uh, whether they're coming to your learning extension centers, whether they're coming into Star House, how has it affected them in that way? And, and what are you doing to try to help them in, in, that, in that part of their lives? Yeah. I, I'll say <clears throat> this is uh, an example of uh, one of my observations at eviction court. Uh, so eviction court, for those who, who don't know, has been moved to the convention center uh, so that we can practice social distancing. We have a number of supportive services there, partnerships with legal aid, uh, job and family services and others to really provide those supportive services to families who are on the verge of being evicted. Um, one of the things that we're very fortunate with uh, the passage of a lot of federal legislation is to have significant resources to provide for rent assistance and avoid evictions um, and, and people becoming homeless. So we were very successful in 2020. Uh, we were able to serve over 5,000 households and distribute $15 million in aid to avoid uh, overwhelming our shelter system. Uh, this year we have over $30 million and potentially uh, another $40 million coming to us. So the money is there. No one has to be homeless. Um, but seeing someone at eviction court, I, I saw an exchange between uh, a landlord and a mother, uh, and I saw a 13-year-old child sitting next to that mother. And I could tell the exchange between um, the landlord and the mother was, there was a lot of bad blood there, but the child is sitting there um, just silent and almost um, expressionless. And as I'm talking to the mother, trying to tell her, hey, we're here to help, we can help you, um, and she was, she really needed to be heard. Uh, and so she, she, she continued the exchange with, uh, with, with the landlord and I'm trying to intervene and eventually um, I really see this young lady and just what she's going through. You could see the mental drain. And so I let the mother know, okay, I do hear you. I respect you. And, and I'm a former uh, English teacher and I love vocabulary. So when we talk about the word respect, it means the etymology of the word is coming from spec, meaning spectacle, to look or to make visible and read to do something again. So it means to look again, to take a deeper look and really see someone and hear them. And when I explain that and then I, I let her know and I let that child know, we're going to be okay. We're going to be able to help you and we can provide the supportive services, the other services that you need to create a plan towards self-sufficiency. Uh, the mental drain on our students, you heard from some of the words that I shared with them, has been tremendous, uh, and that cannot be uh, understated. So this is like one of the really sad parts of working at Star House and with COVID when it hit, it was, um, like I mentioned before, our youth, a lot of them are teetering on the edge and COVID just sort of plucked them over. And our youth also, they don't really have safety nets the way a lot of us, um, have had safety nets growing up. And so when that happened, we saw um, a lot of drug use. So drug use is pretty common among our population anyway. When COVID hit, it, people who 
never touched hard drugs were suddenly experimenting with meth and um, that was a that was the norm a lot of the kids who would shy away from drugs or who maybe occasionally smoked some weed here and there were completely spending their days finding drugs finding ways to get drugs and so the drug drug use really skyrocketed as well as um, mental health exacerbations so we, the depression anxiety most of our youth have PTSD and so the symptoms they were experiencing with PTSD just seemed to get you know they increased we had some fortunate things where some of our youth were getting housed because there were three um, housing units that opened up during the year of COVID, which was perfect and wonderful, and it got kids off the streets. And then we discovered that they have been spending years building up to that, living in communities and on campgrounds and spending their time around other youth, and now they have their own place and there's a quarantine. And so they were really, really lonely. And so access to drugs and loneliness just kind of led to some dark places. Um, luckily, not to mention there's also there was a lack of access to resources, at least in-person resources. Their caseworkers that they had for their mental health services were only doing virtual, which doesn't work for our kids for the most part. Um, but recently we've been seeing some improvements. We've seen kids who want to get a handle on their drug use, and we've got some mentoring programs over at Carol Stewart Village, which is our studio apartment complex, and so that's really, really taking off. They love that. And so there's just we're starting to see some light. At the at the end of this tunnel, but it's been it's been a long road to get there. Sure. It's and getting to, better. Excuse me. But to pick up on that notion that there is light at the end of the tunnel, and, and I think that's at least for me one of the main things I want to try to communicate in 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 this forum today, and it's at a couple of different levels. I mean, first of all, it's absolutely true that our children are experiencing a great deal of trauma. I mean, Nationwide Children's Hospital talks about that. Being in poverty is itself is traumatic and should lead then to uh, uh, behavioral health interventions. That's absolutely true. And, and, the, and what we can do one-to-one -one on relationships matter. And then it's, I think, worth looking at some of the bigger picture. You know, Bo was mentioning rent assistance money that's here. Also in the American Rescue Plan, there is this game changer built in with a child tax credit. Uh, that's, this new tax credit is gonna provide $3,600 for every child under the age of seven and $3,000 for every child between seven and 17. So a, a family that has two kids is gonna end up getting 6,000 plus additional dollars and most folks aren't aware, but this is an advanceable tax credit. And what that means is that starting in July, many households, those in my example with two kids, are going to start getting a monthly check of 500 or $550, depending on the age of those kids. And that's going to give them the ability to not just show up someplace and ask for assistance, which is incredible. I mean, we are so grateful for what Bo and Impact is doing, but they're going to be able to make their own decisions decisions about where they live and that can create enhanced stability for children which is so important about whether they have a basic understanding that the world is trustworthy and that they can count on the world and their parents to provide for them and then the one other thing that I just throw in at this point is that I think it's time now for us to talk about so what are we going to do over the next six or seven months so that our kids are better better positioned when we come back to the next school year. And so, for example, we're a group that for 10 years has run something called Freedom School every summer. It's a program out of the Children's Defense Fund. And so for eight weeks, for uh, Monday through Friday, we'll have kids in structured experiences where there's this evidence-based curriculum that ensures that kids, rather than falling behind in the summer, will actually catch up. And so we're uh, excited about being able to do this one more year, but we're also trying to figure out how to raise awareness and quite frankly, raise money so we can operate not only in two Southside schools, but move to a third. And I just use what we're doing as an illustration. Columbus City Schools itself is creating a whole new initiative called the, the Summer Learning Experience that will operate in multiple schools kind of for a half day period. And, and so it's, really bad out there but that's not i think the message we want to be saying the, the message is 
what do we do when things are really bad? And whether you call it the Columbus way or other phrases, what we do at our best is we rally and use all the resources available. So it's what happens one-on-one, -on -one, it's what happens with local philanthropy, and it's how we use what the federal government is doing to create a springboard so our kids can thrive again. And they can if we do this together. Well, and that's a great point because I, I we talked, you talked about the TikToks and how kids are resilient, and a lot of them have been. They have fought through this just like many parents have, uh, many of our seniors inside, um, you know, long-term uh, long, uh, care facilities have. We've all tried to find a way to fight through this. I wonder how each of your organizations, what have you learned in the last year that I think you're going to be able to put forward for the years to come here that are, are going to, you know, benefit the people that you serve? Because I, I think we've all had to adapt but we've also gotten creative, we've learned a lot, and, and I'm sure there are things that you're like, you know what, you know, COVID kind of forced us into this, but now it's gonna only make us better coming out of it. it, it it's a great question, and uh, to, at least for us at Community Development for All People, I think the most important thing that we've learned and used is that we can never react out of a sense of fear or scarcity. That when things are difficult, it's when the community, and from our faith-based perspective, it's when God is beckoning us to go forward and to believe that in fact the resources can be found if we don't hide you know, in the basement, but rather keep asking the question, how do we adapt, what can we do? And, and it, this is not to make light of social distancing. Those things are essential and, and, and wearing masks and all that. But we do not have to give in to fear. We can have confidence that we can make a difference and we know that our children are depending on us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the really cool things that I noticed in 2020 was there were a lot of organizations that shifted gears, mm -hmm. knew that work needed to be done and that things were really, at, high things were at stake and so there were uh, a lot of organizations that just kind of rolled up their sleeves and dug in the work and helped and they're typically were accustomed to a lot of red tape and a lot of hoops that have to be jumped through and what I saw was a lot of people just working together um, banding together and doing what needed to get done so that folks could be helped the way they needed to be helped. And so I'm hoping that, that um, some of that lingers as things sort of get back to normal. And then the thing that we learned the most, I think, would be that relationships, it's all, I agree with you so much about relationships. Um, and it, we've had to be creative and, and do some different things to make that feasible, to allow space for that to happen. And so that's something that the youth that we serve are actually asking about. They're, when are we gonna have a chance? We call them chilling stations where we get together, we put up a canopy, we pull out a barbecue grill and it's outdoors and we social distance and we hang out together and we eat and they've been wanting to do that um, all over again because they miss seeing people and when they have those connections, they just, they say that they feel stronger and you know they smile more. So that's yeah. what we're gonna focus on. So I'll say at my organization, we have a philosophy of uh, work hard, play hard. And uh, so even this morning, um, as I'm looking out my window at work uh, and it's a dreary day, and then I hear over our PA system, someone playing a song, I've got sunshine on a, <laughs> on a cloudy day. Um, that ability to, to work hard, play hard, to be resilient, even in the face of adversity, it, it, it permeates the culture of our organization and you can feel it. And the kids feel it when they come into our space. Um, we operate an AMP program, Achieve More to Prosper, working with uh, in-school and out-of-school youth who have um, various barriers, ages 16 to 24, as well as the Learning Extension Center. And we've been focusing a lot on seniors, particularly in Marion Franklin and South who uh, have uh, stu seniors who are on track to graduate less than 20%. So we're doing all that we can to make sure that they get on track even through the summer to catch up and graduate uh, into the fall if necessary. Uh, and so I think that just having that spirit, uh, not operating from a place of fear, but understanding that um, some of our greatest growth, and I can say for me personally, uh, some of my greatest um, growth in, in my own personal and professional career has come after some of my biggest failures. Uh, when I learned and when I had the greatest adversity and I learned from that and then went on to um, uh, accomplish greater things. And so we just wanna model that for our kids. Yeah, and 
we're, we're at this point now where the vaccines are starting to roll out. I mean, if 16 and up can get it right now, which is amazing. Pfizer just mentioned that, you know, if you're 12 to 16, they're 100 percent effective. So we might get more kids uh, being able to get vaccines. There's a there's an excitement out there. Uh, but as we mentioned, even with the freedom schools, what do you want to see maybe happen over this spring and summer to so we can springboard kids who are still in school, uh, springboard them into the fall feeling you know, feeling like there's success to be had here, that they're kind of back on the right track. Hopefully schools will be wide open again. You know, everyone can go in and uh, we're not worried about having to wear masks and social distancing and we're not doing hybrid learning. But what do you want to see done in the next three, four months, both policy wise within your organizations, the community? Uh, I'm sure you guys have ideas percolating at all times and and big dreams of what you want to see happen. Well. It I follow up on what I uh, said a moment ago about Freedom School as one example. I th think it is essential that as a community we just are committed to the notion that we'll use the rest of the spring and the summer so that our kids catch up. You know, and so instead of bemoaning how far they've fallen behind, you know, what are we going to do? And there are things. And some of it is structured learning. Uh, um, the Freedom School is this amazing proven entity that really helps at-risk kids develop a love of learning. I, I, I think of one family that I got to know through some of the previous years of Freedom School. When I first met them, they literally were living in, in their car and they had three kids that were in freedom school. I, there's one little boy there who really uh, just said he couldn't read and had no interest. But by the end of that eight week period, that uh, young scholar had developed a love of books. You know, and, and we should never underestimate how much things can change you know, if we believe uh, in the possibility ourselves, and in this case, if we believe in our kids. And, and then at the pol policy level, there's a lot. Um, again, federal policies out of the American uh, Rescue Plan offer a, a great infusion of money and opportunities to build on. And, and so just use one quick illustration that's at a much bigger level, but it's still part of what's in front of us. So it's essential that we, that we have rent help for folks who have fallen behind. It's also true that we simply need to expand the availability of quality, safe, decent, affordable housing. You know, by some estimates, we, we have 53,000 families, you know, uh, uh, that are um, severely house cost burden, and a lot of that's around supply. So part of this is how we look towards the future, but also how right now, you know, we put, uh, you know, uh, the bulldozer in the ground and we begin to build more housing in one area. And then there are other similar aspects of what we can begin to change in terms of public policy, building on, on national opportunities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think so one goal that I have for the youth we serve would be that all the young kids go to freedom school <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. it sounds awesome and I, I have heard of it and yeah. I do like the work that goes on over there. But um, I, what that would look like would be for us to spend the next three months getting the youth, helping them graduate from the first two levels of the Maslow's hierarchy, getting them in a place to where they're not worried about where their next meal is coming from, where they're not worried if they're going to have a roof over their heads, but sort of just like crunching through that, accessing all of the resources that are out there to make that happen. Um, doing a lot of nitty gritty things like helping them get bank accounts open so that they can get their stimulus and file their taxes and just kind of do that sort of thing. So then once those things feel sort of established or at least not so precarious, we'd be able to do things to help them really thrive. And that's kind of our ultimate goal. Freedom School. And I would say for our teenagers, uh, we'd really love to see a robust summer um, jobs program. Uh, I know that the city and county are looking into that and, and have announced uh, some programs. I think that it's important for our community to really get involved. Um, this is going to be a, a interesting summer, uh, obviously with the anniversary of, um, of the murder of George Floyd and all of the protest movements that came out of that. Uh, so we want to make sure that our children have something um, um, enriching and engaging uh, to, to be involved in. So I'd love to see a very robust summer jobs program. Of course, we're going to continue the work of making sure that our seniors uh, can, can get caught up and graduate uh, and then move on to their next. Uh, and then uh, Reverend Edgar is correct. We want to stabilize families who are in crisis. So the rent assistance and we have 
a lot of resources, so there's no reason why landlords um, will need to, to evict people. Uh, we will be able to support them through this pandemic so that we can get to the fall and get back to some sense of a new normal, um, whatever that's going to look like in the fall. Um, but the key also is going to be the transitioning workforce. Um, you know, there were a lot of jobs lost, particularly in the hospitality and leisure industry. Some of those jobs aren't coming back. And so one of the nice things about the American Rescue Plan and the rent assistance that we have available is that we have the ability to pay three months in advance. So for some of those people who have been caught up working two and three part-time jobs struggling to make ends meet, they can never get ahead because they can never get off that hamster wheel and take the time to get the credentials that they need to get ahead. Uh, we have worked workforce programs, uh, career pathways in, in uh, transportation, CDL license, our roads to work program, skilled trades. We know that Central Ohio is going to continue to um, uh, continued to grow uh, by a million people in the next 30 years. And so construction and development is taking place. We're going to have a deficit of skilled trades. We already have pressure now. And then when the American uh, Rescue Plan and potentially an infrastructure plan comes along, there's going to be plenty of jobs, but we need to retrain the workforce. And so this is a unique opportunity where we have the resources and we have the infrastructure to be able to do some of that training. We're going to open it up to questions here in the live stream in just a second, but I never want to let a moment go by when we have three great organizations like this, like Impact, Star House, and Community Development for All People, for people to not know how they can contact you to, to help, whether it's to donate funds or volunteer. Before we go to those questions, I want you all to, I, I need you to pitch everyone, how can they help you do your jobs and do what you want to do to help, uh, help those kids, help the community? Sure. In our case, you can go to the numeral forallpeople.org and go to our website and see the broad array of program we do from housing development uh, to direct services. Uh, financial contributions are always welcome. They, they are. At the same time, as a, there's a theme in what we've been saying about that so much of this work is highly relational. So we're looking for people who want to roll up their sleeves and get involved, whether it's working one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one reading to scholars in our Freedom School this summer or helping to distribute uh, free food. There are so many ways in which it is possible for anyone in this community to have a meaningful hands-on experience where you end up with your own stories to share about how you've seen a life transform. And so we invite you to come out and get involved. We talk about that we dwell inside a divine economy of abundance, and we are that abundance. We are the resources, not just financially, but time and talent. And so I would encourage anyone that's listening to get involved in with any of our organizations directly you'll feel better and you'll transform the lives of children in our community. Yes. Starhouse.us is our website. We appreciate every single dollar that anyone would donate. I also want to give a um, plug or a shout out to neighborrelief.org. And um, they work with a lot of nonprofits in central Ohio and other areas too. And you can, you can uh, put a narrative of a need. So I had a young lady who has a child and her phone bill was, her phone was cut off because she couldn't afford her phone bill. And it made us all really nervous for her to not have that lifeline available, you know, should something happen to her and her child. And so we just put that, we loaded that up on neighborrelief.org. And then it's sort of like a nonprofit, compassionate GoFundMe page. And so anyone, all you have to, it's so easy. I, be careful, <laughs> be careful because on payday, I just kept, wow, it was so fun. But you can just, find, you can read a bunch of stories about people who are struggling and um, you can just one click and donate uh, toward that cause. And so we use that for our youth when they have utility bills or um, phone bills, rent, water, whatever, but also um, starhouse.us, donate, appreciate it. And we really try and facilitate collective impact models, bringing public, private, nonprofit sector together. So anyone who wants to get involved with that strategy, because we're going to address these issues that we have to do it at a systemic level um, and creating those collective impact models are, are critically important. So anyone wanting to get involved uh, in one way, shape or form uh, can reach us at www.impactca.org or by calling us at 614 252-2799.
All right. It is always tradition here. CNBC, CMC to take CNBC is my preschool. That's why I keep going out of E there for no reason. Uh, but CMC's tradition to take audience questions. Lady Cuthbert is uh, taking your questions. And Lady, what do you have? Thanks, Matt. Deborah Jones asks, what recommendations would you make to support efforts to place full-time in-house social workers to st serve students and their families in schools and similarly over the summer would COVID relief funds provide in-house social workers for children at home? Oh, I'm very much in favor of that. I feel that is exactly what is needed. Oftentimes we look at um, our children from an academic lens, but the social emotional support is critically important. Um, you know, looking at that child when I was at eviction court and seeing the furthest thing from her mind was uh, anything dealing with academics. They're in survival mode. She's wondering if she has a place to stay. So having social workers and connecting them to the resources in our community is vitally important. I might be biased, but I think social workers could probably save the world. Um. <laughs> uh. I just echo all of that. Yes, yeah. having that sort of support could be monumental. Yeah. And I would do the same. It, it, would, it would be a great thing and a good use of community resources uh, to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Jennifer Parsons asks a similar question, but how can we talk to kids and make them feel safe about doing day-to-day -day things post-COVID? It's hard for adults to figure that part out. So what about kids? I think in general, children are incredibly uh, adept at observing and are not always good at interpreting what they're observing. I'm just, it's a general thing. And therefore, part of our role as adults is to help children make sense of what they are observing in the midst of this pandemic. And so if they observe that we are frightened and we're anxious, we're gonna pass that on. Uh, and if they observe that we are serious and when appropriate, cautious, but that we believe that our world is fundamentally still a good, caring place where things will get better, that that will make a difference. And I think any adult has a variety of opportunities, if we claim them, you know, to communicate that. So whether I'm with my grandchildren or whether I'm with kids in, in a learning extension center or whether I'm just, you know, talking to kids that I'm meeting while they're coming in and out of our building to get free food. I, it, but all of us can, through our own demeanor, uh, it, it, it sh communicate how we're seeing that this is still a safe, good world where children can trust that we as adults are going to take care of them. Kind of getting back to the opening thing from the Maasai tribe that, that, that Bo was talking about. That's our responsibility and we must not fail when it matters more than ever before. And I would say it's really just being genuine and honest. It's, it's acknowledging, hey, we don't have all the answers, but let's discuss it. Let's, let's interpret. I really love what the Columbus Metropolitan Library did um, th th this uh, recently with the common book um, on how to be an anti-racist. It was really a way for us to have a conversation about what we were seeing and hearing and then talking to kids uh, in a language that's accessible to them to, to process their thoughts and their feelings. Uh, we've used that and had multiple conversations and I think having those tools and just having a real conversation is, is really important in a starting place. We may not have all the answers, but let's talk it out and let's figure it out together. I'm, I'm just gonna jump in just because my, I'm not an expert by any means, but I, and I'm a big brother with big brothers, big sisters, and it's ever a time for people to become mentors and, and listen to our children out there. Sometimes they just want to be heard. Yeah. And again, you may not have an answer for them, but they just want to be heard, get whatever, whatever's off their chest. Uh, I can't think of a better thing to be right now than just be a mentor, someone just listening, like you say, give honest feedback and answers to people. Um, those young people are out there right now. I think that is so, so important. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just to tag on to the part about youth um, observing and then interpreting things 
<laughs> sometimes in some really bizarre ways. Um, I think it's important. I agree with, you know, need to articulate what's going on and help them to understand the situation. And then if you, as a parent, if you are feeling anxious or nervous or whatever it is that you're feeling, um, they're going to sense that too. And it can be pretty helpful to normalize those emotions, let them know it's really natural to feel certain ways. And this is in the, I feel this way too. And here's how I'm thinking about things. Here's how I'm doing to help myself feel better. Here's how I'm distracting myself from, you know, just being able to walk them through how you're coping so that they, they can know that it's pretty natural for them to feel that way. What would you say to those who feel that COVID might have created a lost generation? I'm going to show my bias here. I, I appreciate that language, but I think it's it's harmful. Uh, I mean, Self-fulfilling prophecies are real, and so we want to create and then live into the script that 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 is a better one than saying we lost a generation. You know, I, I think the script is, uh, it, it, you know, it, as was being said a moment ago, we need to be honest and say, hey, this is bad. You know, we're not trying to deny any of that, but to say not only, we know kids are resilient in general, we know that it is possible to move forward, to catch up, you know, to even leapfrog over, and, and I just, think that that's the message and I'm not talking about just being an optimist but rather this notion that in one sense the glass always is half full and so what are we going to do with the water that's in the glass even if the glass isn't filled to the top and and right now I think that's the message we did not lose a generation what we have is a urgent situation where we owe something and can contribute something so our kids thrive I think it's about stepping up. Yeah. Uh, there's potential, definitely there's potential for things to be forever negatively impacted by this 2020 pandemic. I think we can also look at it and hopefully in hindsight we do see that we actually created a generation of you know, fighters, survivors, warriors and whatnot. And we're living the narrative now. I don't think we can say anything's definitively happened yet. Yeah, I would agree with, with everything. Um, you know, one of the quotes I use, I, I love to use with kids is, is from Michael Jordan, where he said, I, I've lost or I've missed almost 9,000 shots. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been counted on to take the game winning shot and missed. I failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. It's not the failure. It's not the adversity. It's what you do when you fall down, you get back up and you keep moving forward. Um, what's really important is for everyone to get involved and for us to treat our children uh, like the Maasai warriors where we're concerned about all children in our community, whether I'm a parent or non-parent. Uh, let's get involved. This generation is not lost. I do appreciate the sentiment because it is ringing an alarm that yes, we need to get involved. Um, there are red flags and if we do nothing, then yes, we could lose a generation. So that is the call. Get involved, volunteer, become a mentor so that we can reclaim our children and then one day say all the children are well. Um, Dean Pullman asks, what can media, especially TV, do to advance community awareness of resources and opportunities for children over the next three months? which can mitigate the impacts of COVID. I feel like that's directed at me. Uh, so I, I, I completely agree. I mean, that, that's something that I know is personal to me. I have tried to find every different um, organization or uh, some opportunity for a child to get out and get involved in something, you know, whether it's a physical activity, a social activity. Uh, now that things are starting to open up, we're starting to see these different ways, you know, first it was, you know, how do we stay connected over Zoom and these virtual gatherings? Well, now that we can try to maybe get a little um, closer together, I think it's our responsibility to make sure, you know, we publicize those things, um, but also to seek out, you know, not just, you know, when someone says, hey, we have something going on, we need to keep seeking out where the issues are in these communities, call them out so maybe an organization sees it and then, they, they want to um, make a difference in that. Uh, I know I just recently did a story with uh, Ashley Pryor, who is starting Relentless Rowing uh, Company, which is a rowing organization that is seeking minorities in Central Ohio 
to take part in rowing, which has been a primarily, you know, homogenous sport. Uh, and, you know, if you look at the class structure of it, it normally takes a lot of money to get involved in rowing. She wants to, she wants to stop that. So she's looking for grants and donations, and she already has four or five or so um, uh, young females and males that are in getting involved in rowing. And I, I got to go on a boat and row with them. It's great. So things like that. I'll do my part. I will challenge all of our TV stations and, and newspapers and blogs and websites, whatever it is, to do the same, uh, because these organizations are doing their part, and we, you know, we need, we'd love to highlight them, but there are many more uh, smaller, you know, nonprofits, people that are trying to do their part too. But you guys let us know. Anything, anything, <laughs> everything, please. Absolutely. Along those lines, is there a conglomerate website where people can go to see all available resources similar to all of us signing up for our shots are getting on one website and seeing every available place from, from how you get your stimulus, how do you file your taxes, where can a child go for a summer program? Do, is anyone aware of that? And do you have thoughts about how that might happen? I am not aware of that resource, but that is a great idea. I think that's uh, an idea for us to do some collaboration and put that out there. Yeah, it, it would be very helpful. And in the interim, there's a sense in which groups like each of ours, we have staff people who are trying to do that. It would be better to do it in a more centralized way. And then simultaneously, instead of saying, well, it's just so disorganized, there's no way to figure it out. You know, with folks who are coming to settlement houses, I would assume Star House, I know to our organization, you know, we've got folks whose, whose job and passion is to listen to people articulate their hopes, what they want to see happen next for them or their kids, and then match them up. It would be great for it to be more centralized. Uh, and there are people that are working hard to keep those networks going. Yeah. The website that I sometimes use is CAP for Kids, the number four. And then uh, Franklin County Children's Services has a resource manual attached to their website that also has stuff. So there's a bigger one, and I just can't remember the name of it. But those two are, um, until something is more, yeah. something bigger exists, those two are kind of my go-tos. When we're here in this place in 2022, what do you want to hear were the results of what we did this year? I think s several things. You know, uh, uh, one, I, 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 I dream that it would be a whole lot of stories uh, that pick up some of the, what Matt was saying. Hey, I decided to become a mentor. I mean, uh, uh, that kind of, that's part of the narrative. I think we also are yearning and working for stories about how, it, it, it will be too soon to say it, but you know, it was during World War II that, 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 that everything seemed terrible, and then we now talk about that as the greatest generation. And, and I do hope, and I, Jill, picking up on some of what I think you were implying, that that even by 2022, we'll be able to say, it's just incredible to see what those kids have come through and what they're doing, and how many you know, seniors got back on track and graduated, and, and those various things. And certainly as a community, we, from my perspective, must tackle some of these systemic issues. We, not only we have too many folks who are homeless, we have this acute shortage of housing, and we can, in a year, begin to do some things to build more affordable housing, to build in sustainable rent subsidies, and we can help people maximize that benefit. Where example, we're gonna have a lot of households who are gonna come out of poverty for the first time in their lives because of the child tax credit and other things in the American Rescue Plan. And so I hope we'll be making those, those policy changes permanent and we'll be celebrating the stories of people who in their own personal agency took those additional resources and their lives are better. And, and I think we'll have a lot of Freedom School graduates that will talk about how cool that is. <laughs> yes. I think it would be cool to look back and say that 2022 we focused at Star House on sustainability because the, we didn't have any other homeless youth to work with because yeah. there just weren't any. We were able to get them all housed um, and, and settled in and stable and now we just work with them on 
the the upper levels of the hierarchy. So we work with them on education and their goals and the actual what it means for them to thrive. And so and eventually I just won't even have a job because it'll be utopia. So. <laughs> And for all those who are struggling, um, I want them to know they're not alone, um, that their struggle is real, um, but this too shall pass. Uh, and I will end the same way I started. I want this to be truly one Columbus prosperity for all. And when we ask the question, and how are the children, I want to hear the response, all of the children are well. Well, thank you to everyone. I hope you found today's forum uh, very enlightening. I learned more about the challenges that our youth are facing, but also I have some optimism hearing from these organizations about what they're doing and ask all of us to think about what we can do to help. Our forum next week welcomes back our first limited live audience for traditional Metropolitan Club lunch and show. For those who cannot attend in person, the live stream option will still continue. Next week will also be the premiere of a new CMC series, Trends That Will Shape Us, featuring local leaders discussing major economic and social trends. The first one will be about trends in transportation and how they may affect business and life in the future. Let's thank today's sponsor, the Robert Weiler Company and NBC4. Thanks also to the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation for presenting our live stream in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch, PNC, and NPC4I. Thanks again to all of our online virtual seat patrons. And special thanks to our wonderful speakers today. We couldn't do it without you. The Reverend John Edgar, Jill Gorse, Robert Bo Chilton, and Matt Barnes. We hope you'll tune in next week, and until then, be well and stay safe.